We're totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll out! We are totally booked. Welcome to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Find the podcast at bookedonrock.com. You can find every episode of Booked on Rock there, along with links to your favorite listening platforms. Exclusive videos, blogs, links to all of the social media sites, and the latest rock book releases all there. Jeff Harkness is a first-time guest. He's here to talk about his latest book, Rain King, The Life and Music of Adam Duritz and Counting Crows. This is the complete story of Counting Crows one of the most successful bands of the last three decades, and their charismatic vocalist and songwriter, Adam Duritz. Over 20 million albums sold, led by several hit singles, including Mr. Jones, A Long December, and Accidentally in Love. The book chronicles the writing and recording process of all six studio albums and how the band reimagined the songs on the road. We also get the incredible story of Adam Duritz, who survived struggles with mental health, fame, and relationships. This is the first time we find out the lost history of his upbringing, the decade he spent on the San Francisco music scene, and the real stories of the people he chronicled in his lyrics, including Jennifer Aniston and Courtney Cox. Jeff talks about all of that in this discussion. A link to hear a playlist of Counting Crows can be found on the show notes page. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. It's great to meet you. Hey, Eric, thank you. Really happy to be here. Thanks a lot. I have been looking forward to this. Brings you back to the day. I remember the first time I heard Counting Crows, Mr. Jones, and remember guys in college. One particular friend of mine, he said, you have to get this new album, this CD, you know, at the time, CD. You have to get it. We both worked at the college station. They're called Counting Crows, August and everything after. You got to check it out. And I finally did. And I'm so glad that my gateway was then. And so I'm curious as to when you became a fan of Counting Crows. Yeah. Also, from the very beginning, I was working in a bookstore at the end of 1993. That's right when the, you know, about the time their first album came out. And Mr. Jones had just been released to college radio as a single. And I think this was the November or maybe December issue of College Music Journal, CMJ. And they ha- they always gave away a CD in that issue. And I worked at the bookstore. The employees would get the free ones at the end of the month. And I always take that CD and, and listen to it. And the second song on that CD was Mr. Jones by Counting Crows. Now, this is pre-internet, so you can't just dial them up and and go, oh, who is this? Let's hear some more of their stuff. It just had the one song. But I distinctly remember, I mean, I remember where I was when I played it and also playing that song about 20 times in a row. I was just blown away at how great it was. I had no idea who the band was. I'd never heard the song, never heard of the band. And uh, that was Mr. Jones. And I, I sort of put it in the back of my mind. They then played Saturday Night Live a you know month or two later. The August album kind of blew up, and and then I became a huge fan of that album, just like everybody else. I fell in love with that album. I think that when it comes to Counting Crows fans, you have the fans who really loved that first album and and thought in some ways the band ever topped it. Then you also have those fans like me who loved the first album, but then also loved the second album in some ways even more. Loved the third album. You know, we like we stuck with the band as they grew and as they changed and really, you know, liked and appreciated a lot of the things that came after that first album as well. Um, not to take away from the greatness of it, because it's it's today still brilliant. To me, they have a, a very interesting sort of musical trajectory and also faced interesting challenges as a band because Adam Duritz was, you know, effectively 29, 30 years old when he made it. Their story is very different than the, you know, 20 year old coked out rock star, you know, on the road. It's a different story. And to me, a more interesting story as someone who's also older, how did he grapple with the fact that he became famous basically late in the game for a pop singer and and had to sort of confront that challenge and build a career despite the fact that he was, you know, five to 10 years older than his peers, like, you know, somebody like John Mayer, who was young, heart Rob or, or um, you know, Matchbox 20 with Rob Thomas. Those were some of his close competitors, Eddie Vedder. And, and that I think that created a unique set of challenges for, for Adam as a songwriter and also a, a public figure. And he grappled with some of those issues in public. And, you know, for me, it was, I, I appreciate how honest he is about his emotional struggles, his, his mental health struggles, his physical struggles with his weight. He's been very honest about that and open about that in a way that 
many male rock stars especially aren't and there, there's a, a great uh vulnerability there i think and i really appreciate about him and I think it's interesting having a book like this answers the question, what happened or what was going on with Adam Duritz before he makes it big at the age of 29 or 30. And that's what we get to in the book. Let's go back yeah. even before then as a yeah. child, continual relocation. What's his childhood right. like? Where is he born? What's life like for Adam Duritz as a child? Right. Well, he did. He was interesting story. Again, he was his father was a doctor, although just is still in medical school when Adam was born uh, in in uh, Maryland and uh, moved, you know, lived there for a few years, but then moved, relocated to Texas. And he had a, a sister who was a couple of years younger. He, he had spent his early childhood in Texas and wrote about how, you know, he this was the first time he had left the house by himself. He went exploring and started to just open up and learn about the world. He also says that a bit of his Texas drawl that he sings with comes from that early period. The family then moved to Colorado for a little while. And ultimately, when he was 10 years old, the family moved to Berkeley, California, where he spent, you know, those his sort of teenage and years and then ultimately his 20s as well, living in the Bay Area. But his mother decided at some point that she was going to go to medical school uh, and become a doctor like his father. But for whatever reason, she ended up going to medical school in Mexico. And so I think his mother was was gone for significant periods of his uh, adolescent life. And she said in an interview that, that the relocation and some of that stuff was difficult for him. So he had, in some ways, a privileged lifestyle because he was born to a family that had means. He did live in a nice house and, and um, you know, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I, th I think he also had some struggles early on. He, you know, went to private schools and things like that. Incidentally, yes, right near where I live here. I'm in Connecticut, yeah. right? Okay. Southington, Connecticut, Watertown, Connecticut. Taft School is where he went. He went for one year in 1978. Found out that in your book, private boarding high school in Watertown, Connecticut. And the funny story he tells in concert in Hartford here when he played one time, he says he flunked his music course. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of all things. Yeah. Well, and that's the, that, that's what it was, was me, somebody who's been a fan and sort of followed their story, finding, discovering these pieces of his life that for me were missing in my own sort of understanding of who he is as an artist. So f finding those pieces and putting the story together, it was a real journey for me too. I mean, I wrote the book in chronological order. And I didn't really start, you know, chapter two until chapter one was done and start chapter three until chapter two was done. So that really the story unfolded for me as well as I was writing it. And I was discovering uh, his his story in, in ways that I didn't realize that I would. Well, the challenge for you was, as you said in the book, was getting the correct information because I think you had said there were different sources had different stories or it was just trying trying to piece together the story accurately was a challenge conflicting accounts of certain right. things was was one issue so for example their famously their first album was recorded in a house i mean they recorded several albums in houses but that first one was they decided they would record the album in a house like the band did recording big pink but there are several different people attributed to who came up with that idea i, I think i found four different people who took credit or who adam gave credit for uh, we are living in that house. So how do you decide? Ultimately, I, I had to try to find some consensus, but there were still pieces of the story that were missing to me and, and remain missing. I mean, I'd love to sit down and pick Adam's brain about all of those little details. I've, I've been able to ask him a couple of questions. So maybe in this, maybe in the revised second edition, I'll, I'll clarify some of those. Points. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Talk about the bands he was in early on quite a few bands, but specifically there's the first band he's in because there's a connection to the Counting Crows breakthrough song, Mr. Jones, who's a member of that band. Right. Yeah. Model Society was his very first band. And he's Adam has always been a band guy. He talks about he didn't want to be a solo artist, even though he writes 100 percent of the lyrics and about 95 percent of the music for Counting Crows. He's very much a band guy, he wants to be in a band. So that first band, Model Society, where he kind of learned what it was like to be in a band, featured a lot of different musicians, one of whom was Marty Jones, who is the Mr. Jones of the Mr. Jones song. And that that song is very much a, a very straightforward narrative of a night that he and Marty Jones had out on the town uh, at a flamenco show that was that was uh, 
Marty Jones's father is a famous flamenco musician, so they had just seen that show, and he, he kind of describes what happens in that song. But yeah, Marty Jones interestingly shows up in several of Adam's earlier bands, and somehow doesn't make it to Counting Crows, uh, yeah. <laughs> even though I think he played on the earliest demos. But yeah, and it's who, too bad. Somehow M Marty Jones got left aside. But I, I think they're still good friends. Amazing to think that he got so tired of fighting with his bandmates that he quit music for a period, dropped out of music to work in landscaping and construction, saves up money, takes a backpacking trip to Europe. This is in the summer of 1989. He returns mm -hmm. to music full time. Three projects. Sorted Humor, the Himalayans, and the acoustic duo Counting Crows with Adam and David Bryson. So mm -hmm. tell us about this story. There's a rep from EMI Records. He has his sights set on these two guys, but he's he's got this Simon and Garfunkel <laughs> thing in his mind. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, I mean, what's interesting, Adam said, this was the first time in his entire life that anyone from a record company had ever come to see him play. He was 27 years old, the first time anybody came to see him play. And he had been playing in bands for most of his 20s in, in the Bay Area. So somebody from EMI, the label that once signed the Beatles, comes comes to see him play and says, all right, guys, I, I think we got a, something, you know, we can put together. So he calls a meeting. He well, you know flies them down to Hollywood, to EMI at Hollywood and says, OK, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you you're going to be the grunge era of Simon and Garfunkel. We're going to have you wear black turtlenecks and sport coats. You're going to do an acoustic version around here with lasers beaming on you. Oh, <laughs> like this God. crazy like, concept that he had. We're going to, you know, he said, I'm going to give you a development deal. We're going to make this video. Here's what we're going to do. And, you know, Adam said he was really conflicted. It sounded nuts to him. But at the same time, it was his only offer. It was the first time he had ever had anybody give him a real offer. And this was a real record company. It yeah. wasn't you know, some fly by night little indie label or something. This was a and, tw and 27 years old. To keep in mm -hmm. mind, 27, you're starting to think, mm -hmm. is this it? This might be I'll my only shot. Check. Yeah, I'll just take the yeah, because the know? time's That's, running out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he didn't. I mean, to his credit, he made some phone calls. He he reached out and ultimately somebody connected him through a friend of a friend. And they got the, the Counting Crows demo to a lawyer uh, who listened to it, loved that he was blown away, immediately offered to represent the band but also got them in touch with real management. And, and, you know, from there, the band started to come together. It became obvious at this point that Counting Crows was going to be the one of really these two. Adam was also in the, the lead singer of the Himalayans. The, between those two acts, the Counting Crows and the Himalayans, Counting Crows was going to be the one to kind of go all the way. So it seemed like at this point, he sort of put all his eggs into that basket. The third band he was in, he was sorted humor he was singing back up and, and they were you know, great friends and stuff but i don't think that was a project that he was you know at the center of but of these two projects that he was really involved in it became clear that counting crows was going to be the one to go all the way some of that had to do with some of these key industry figures who got involved and and sort of you know worked behind the scenes to put the band uh, yeah. out into the public you know and what's the origin of the band name it was uh, it was initially a nursery rhyme book Yes, it's a it's a traditional English nursing rhyme. Uh, that one for sorrow, two for joy, three. You know that that's all from you know parts of the nursery rhyme. But yeah, it's like a classic uh, nursery rhyme, children's nursery rhyme. But nice, nice imagery too. And I feel like they they've done some nice things with with that sort of concept and and that imagery just throughout their career. I think their album covers are, are sort of interesting looking and. I don't know if you think of the Van Gogh painting, like the black crows over the wheat field painting. In some ways, it, it, some of their album art reminds me of that. Go through the tracks on August and everything after from 1991. It's very close to perfect, in my opinion. <laughs> Round Absolutely. here, Omaha, Mr. Jones, perfect blue buildings, which I believe Adam said is his personal favorite. And it begins time and time again, Rain King, Sullivan Street, which might be my personal favorite. Ghost Train, Raining in Baltimore, A Murder of One. That's a yeah. killer track listing right there. The lineup on August and Everything After is Adam Duritz on vocals, piano, and harmonica, David Bryson on guitars, Charlie Gillingham on keyboards, Matt Malley on bass, and Steve Bowman on drums. Although he's not on Mr. Jones. He's not on Mr. Jones, I, which I did not realize until I wrote the book. Right. Yeah. Right. And then also David Immergluck played a lot of stuff on that first album. He's credited, but this just before Dan Vickery joined the band, David Immergluck quit the band after the album was recorded 
went and did his own thing. He came back to the band later, but that's when Dan Vickery joined. So Dan Vickery didn't play on the first album. He wasn't in the band at all, but he's in the videos and he played on the tour and he's been in the band. He's still in the band today. The Booked on Rock podcast will be back after this. Let's talk about Mr. Jones because that was not intended to be the first single. You write that Mr. Jones, the band's breakthrough single, number five on Billboard's Hot 100 Airplay charts, was the most difficult song to capture. Can you talk about that and how it was initially not intended to be the first single? Well, the one of the things that they did was they sort of test marketed some of the songs, the several of the songs from August and everything after got radio play. And they were the record company really liked uh, A Murder of One. Uh, with a, I think it's the last song in the album. It has, as Adam has described it, the Jesus Jones right here, right now, drum beat. You know, then the yeah. radio, the radio loved it. The record company loved it, and they said, "This is the song." You know, don't, 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 don't. That all your life, you know. Yep. That that was going to be the single, and the that was getting some airplay, and the record company said, "This is going to be the one." It's got the funky beat, and it's going to put you over. Adam thought. Mm, he he was more in favor of something like Mr. Jones. He thought that was the perfect introduction to the world. And everybody seemed to think that Rain King was going to be the song on the album. The big song on the album was going to be Rain King. Adam thought so. The record company thought so. They, they were sort of saving that one for the, to be the, the big breakout hit. Uh, not thinking the record company didn't have a, a ton of faith in Mr. Jones. And ultimately, they couldn't come to a decision. And there was no single that was released when August 1st came out. Geffen just refused to release a single and just put the album out. And it was actually several months. That's when that Mr. Jones came out on CMJ. It was months later. They finally released it to college radio. They finally did a video. It finally started to get some airplay and blow up. What's interesting about the recording of it and the part I, I really didn't know this is that their drummer couldn't get, just couldn't seem to find the beat. He said, I just, you know, couldn't find it. I, I, I couldn't feel it. They tried a number of takes, did it over and over again. It just didn't click. And finally, the producer, T-Bone Burnett, came to him and said, OK, let's try it again. And, and finally, Steve Bowman just said, no, I wouldn't know what to do. I've tried everything. You're not satisfied with what I'm doing. And I'm just kind of giving up. And so T-Bone Burnett immediately just replaced him with a studio drummer who came in and did it in like two takes. And that became the take. What's interesting is that when the song blew up, this certainly caused a, a rift between Steve Bowman and, and the rest of the group and and ultimately was sowed, sowed the seeds for his departure. He left or let's say departed after that first album. Round Here was a was a hit single, number seven on the U.S. mainstream charts, seven on alternative rock radio. Rain King was number four on U.S. mainstream charts. But Round Here, this song goes all the way back to 1989. Yeah, it's well, it's a it's a Himalayan song. That's what's interesting about around here is that it predates Counting Crows. Even it's a Himalayan song, and in fact, they have writing credits on it. Some of the guys from that band, the Himalayans, you can look at the live YouTube versions that they played back in the clubs in San Francisco, and you can hear it's a it's a similar song back then, but much more of a like a hard rock, almost a Pearl Jam type of sound to it. It changed a lot. Uh, it became much more emotional when the Counting Crows did it. But certainly the seeds were there. They talked about specifically that song and how he and Bryson, as the acoustic duo, would go into these open mic nights. They'd get like one song to play. You know, it's an open mic night, so everybody gets a song. Here come all the amateurs doing their things. And then Adam and Bryson would go up and do Round Here and just blow the club away, you know, with, with the yeah. performance because it's such a powerful song. August and Everything After reaches number four, seven times platinum in the U.S. Now Adam's thrust into fame very quickly. Things get crazy, so much so that he can't even walk out of his apartment without being accosted. Right. So much media attention put on his relationship with Jennifer Aniston, but that really didn't last long. How do they meet? How, and how does that partnership end? That was something I, I wanted to clarify for myself because we've all heard that story a million times about how he's dated the two actresses from friends but i never quite understood the story i just heard that and so i i wanted to in this book i wanted to tell what the definitive account of of those stories just because one i i thought they were you know there's there's such a, a big thing about him but also they influenced his writing of that second album and that's to me why i was really interested in it so his relationship with aniston was very short-lived they just went out a couple of times they were introduced by friends adam be, he became so famous that he couldn't go home anymore in, in Oakland. 
he would go to his house and literally there were fans camped out on his lawn. He would peek out his curtains and people were screaming at him. There he is and stuff. I mean, he said it was crazy. So he moved. He said, I, I couldn't even live in my house anymore. He had to move to Los Angeles. So he moved to Los Angeles and started tending bar at the Viper Room, which was a celebrity hangout co-owned by Johnny Depp. So now he's hanging out with Sean Penn and Johnny Depp and the celebrities in Hollywood. And they, through through his friends in Hollywood, they said, oh, Jennifer Aniston. She, they had just had the first season of Friends came out. She was very famous. This was after the first album. He was very famous. Let's introduce these two young, beautiful people. They met, they went out a couple of times. It just didn't click. Adam later says, they, you know, they never slept together. It wasn't a great romance. It was just, they went out a couple of times. But he later then developed a relationship with Courtney Cox. And this was a much more significant relationship. Yeah. I, I would say Jennifer Aniston and Courtney Cox are friends. They're still friends. They've been friends for ever since, you know, they were on that show together years ago. And, you know, if you're close friends with somebody, you don't go date their ex. So it's more like, oh, yeah. I, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if Jennifer Aniston's like, no, he's a nice guy. Like, you know, we, we didn't hit it off, but you should go out with him. So they became involved and got much more involved. And Recovering the Satellites, the second album is a double album. Well, the second half of the second side of that double album the songs are largely written about Courtney Cox. Yeah. And it was a crazy. very tumultuous relationship. It went on for a long time. Famously, she's in the Long December music video. Most people assume that's where they met, but this was at, at the sort of end of their relationship rather than the beginning. They even wrote a song together called Barely Out of Tuesday uh, that he kind of refuses to play uh, anymore because, because of the history there. But apparently it didn't go well. I mean, she ended up, getting involved with David Arquette and ultimately marrying him. They met on the set of Scream. This was during the time that she was at least, I don't know, seriously involved with Adam, but around this same time. And so it seemed like it was a bad breakup and it didn't go well for him. At least if you look at his songs that he wrote, you know, they're not, they're not love songs. <laughs> no, exactly. They're no, more about the dif difficulties and challenges of that relationship. Jeff Harkness is the author of Rain King, The Life and Music of Adam Duritz and Counting Crows. It's out now. A song written in 91, but not on the August album, was Einstein on the Beach for an Eggman. What a great song. Their first number one on the modern rock chart. It was included on a rarities release by their label DGC Records in 1994. Sophomore Counting Crows album, the aforementioned Recovering the Satellites, released in 1996. Number one on Billboard, two times platinum. Angels of the Silences, number three on the alternative charts, number four on Mainstream Rock, Daylight Fading, Have You Seen Me Lately, and A Long December, the other singles. A Long December, top 10 on Mainstream Rock, number five on the alternative chart. You write that this song was written at the tail end of another extended day. You say its origins are in a piano ballad that Adam had previously written. And by the way, this is a song I just was watching a YouTube video interview of him. He says this is the one song he never gets tired of playing live. Yeah, it's it's an enduring classic. And I think also the fans, not just the Counting Crows fans, but music lovers around the world have embraced that song. I think Long December has become more popular now than it was even when it came out. And it's always been a, a song that you know people really appreciated. But yes, it's the one song you can almost guarantee he'll play in concert. He still loves it. He also said that he it was one of the two songs that he wrote that was almost effortless. It just came out almost as a whole piece. It was recorded in one, not that it wasn't the first take, but it was recorded as a single live take. And I think it was like the sixth take. There's just a few little overdubs on it, but it's essentially a live recording of that song. And um, it's a beautiful piece. I mean, one of the things about Counting Crows that I think is so important is that you know, they're they're one of the great American bands. They have a deep catalog of great songs. And Along December, you mentioned Einstein on the Beach and certainly all of these other songs that we've been talking about. They have a deep catalog of great songs throughout their career. And I think Long December is just another one of those touch points where you go. This is a band that's writing songs that are on par with, you know, Let It Be or, or Yesterday or, you know, I mean, name name some of the greatest songs that have ever been written. I think Counting Crows belongs in that same conversation. Lyrically, it's just brilliant. We were talking about this before we started recording. His lyrics, yeah. the smell of hospitals in winter and mm -hmm. the feeling that it's all a lot of oysters, but no pearls. All at once, you look across a crowded room to see the way that light attaches to a girl. He does create these, he paints these pictures 
in your mind but he also has a lot of characters in his songs sometimes i think mm. they're all real people but i don't know maybe some of the some of them are just a Most combination of, of people that he knows but uh, uh what is uh, long december about again isn't that an actual wasn't he actually in a hospital or it, it's in your yeah. book right? it's a, it's another crazy story the origin story of that song a good friend of his well a, a, a former girlfriend a good friend of hers got in a terrible car accident and Adam was sort of tagging along and went they went to visit her in the hospital. And and the mother of this hospital patient was there and she was saying, we, you know, we kind of want people to come in and talk to her and be with her. She's going to be hospitalized for like, she was in bad shape. So they were looking for friends of hers to come in and hang out. And it turned out that there was really nobody who could come in during the day because everybody worked. The only person who was available during the day was Adam, who didn't know this person, but out of the kindness of his heart, agreed to come in during the day and kind of hang out. And he would bring in a VHS player and VHS tapes and they would watch movies together. And they kind of developed like a, a platonic friendship in this hospital. And so he would go there every day. Now, after he would go to the hospital, somebody else would come in. He would go record with the band. They were working on recovering the satellites. And then at night, he would go tend bar at the Viper Room. And so his he said, I was kind of in this routine, especially because of this person in the hospital where, you know, this was kind of his life. And so he said at the end of one of those long nights, he had finished up at the Viper Room. They went up to a friend's house in the Hollywood Hills. Everybody called it Hillside Manor, and uh, which is a lyric in the song. And he said just in that night after he went home, he just wrote this song sort of describing that whole day, you know, hospitals and winter and the and the Hillside Manor and, and all of these different sort of components. So it's a very straightforward and descriptive song. And you mentioned the names too. Often his songs like Anna's a Real Person, Elizabeth is a Real Person. Uh, and he wrote these songs about them. I think Maria is the one who's who's not based on a you know actual person, but ma- many of the Mrs. Potter is a real person. Many of the the people in his songs are real people. Many of the places that he describes are real places. And Desert Life, he he said he was singing about Ohio a lot because he was dating this woman from Ohio. And so you hear all those songs about seeing Ohio rise and all that stuff that, that just cut a page directly from his life. He once said uh, that lyric you read is so good. He once said that, you know, his whole approach to writing is that instead of saying, oh, I saw this this woman and it was love at first sight, he says that line about the way the light attaches to her. You know, like that's his yeah. same way of saying that thing. So he he said he always takes that approach of trying to say something that we all understand, but in a way that is very artistic and yeah, uh, thought provoking. Well, yeah, and yeah. he pulled it off and he still does. Although it hits number one and sold two million copies, there was critical backlash to recovering the satellites. And that, I yeah. guess, because it sold less than half of August, the band it takes a hit in the press. But as you say, choosing artistry over commerce on that album puts themselves on a path to longevity, much like Pearl Jam, This Desert Life, 1999. I have specific memories of this album because I had just gotten my first full-time job in radio and I I did mm-hmm. 6 to 10 p.m. weeknights and we played Hanging Around every night I played that. That was a lead single, I believe. Yes, it was. They released yeah. Hanging Around before they released the album. It came out like the summer yeah. before. And yeah, yeah, it was a classic. This is about his days in Berkeley? Yeah, so that's another, you know, very descriptive song. He, you know, he spent his most of his 20s living in Berkeley, playing in bands hanging out in bars he as he described it during that period of his life he was drinking a lot he was doing a lot of drugs and he wrote a murder of one about this period of time too murder of one is about what are you going to do with your life you know are you going to waste your life are you just going to stand here are you going to get up and and live your life and he decided kind of at that age 27 or something you know what i'm not just going to fade away and become this obscure musician i'm going to make a stamp on the world and and decided to stand up. So hanging around is a, a description of what his life was like back in those days in Berkeley, drinking in the bars, hanging, hanging around with his friends and, and uh, you know, just kind of wasting his life away as he later described it. And I think he said he, he loved that period, but also he realized that he couldn't stay there or he would have gotten stuck. Number 28 on the Billboard Hot 100. So Mrs. Potter's Lullaby and All My Friends, we mentioned that too, other singles on that album goes platinum reached number eight on billboard they really hit the road hard for this particular album 
Talk about the Counting yes. Crows approach to their music live, some reimagining that they do with the songs. What are some highlights for you personally? Uh, you know, songs that sound even better live than on record, very, very much mm-hmm. like Springsteen's like that. Certain songs mm-hmm. are even better live. Yeah, no, those are that's very insightful. And, and you're absolutely right about that. I think one of the hallmarks of Counting Crows, if you are a big Counting Crows fan, it's largely based upon their live performances because they take those wonderful and amazing studio albums and then they transform them into something else. Now there, there's a subset of folks who can't stand when bands do this, but many of us music lovers love it when, you know, Bob Dylan was famous for this, Bruce Springsteen, as you say, deconstructing their material, reinterpreting their own material in new ways. And so counting crows started doing that very early on. Improvising was the first thing adding Lyrics from like Thunder Road, Bruce Springsteen's Thunder Road. They would add, Adam would really? sing that in the middle of oh, Rain really? King. They would blend it in. And there's oh, amazing, well, go back to 94 and you're going to hear some incredible Thunder Road alternatives in the middle of Rain King. How cool and, is that? So yes, early on, he they started from their almost their first tour, in, well, from their first tour, incorporating lyrics of other songs into their own material, including sordid humor, Bruce Springsteen. I mean, just you you could spend, you could write a whole book about just the alts. And some people have done whole websites and things like that. Then also the other thing was, and this really started more on the second album, but also became a trademark of, of oh, the first one too, but very much deconstructing their songs. So taking a song like Angels of the, of the Silences, which is one of their hardest rocking numbers, they often will, I just saw them, reinterpret that as an acoustic number with like five part harmony and almost, wow. you know, with mandolins and, and accordions and all that kind of stuff. So they will take a song that's their hardest rocking song and they'll do it like, you know, like a rain King or something like that. They'll take a song like that and, and transform it too. So for the fans, for the big fans, we love those moments where they improvise or where they add something new or where they change it up. And even on their latest tour, I mean, I just saw them less than a month ago. And Adam came up with this incredible alt that is brand new for around here. That it's all about the summer and the summer's almost gone and school's about to start. And yeah, it's incredible. You can go watch yeah. the videos. So they're, they're still vital. They're still changing it up. They're still, you know, they don't, they don't paint within the lines. They, they're not formulaic. Even still, they change it up. The Book Done Rock podcast will be back after this. You talk in the book about how Adam had to navigate the Crow's career through a period of significant turmoil and change. Talk about some of the difficulties he faced in the years to come, particularly when it came to battles with record labels. One of the things was I built the book around the making of each one of their albums, and each one had its own story. It was unique. Different producers recorded in different places. The albums had different themes, and they had different things going on behind the scenes as well. And I I wanted to sort of show some of how the music industry operates behind the scenes. So what happened during Desert Life is they're recording this album once again in a house. It's coming together well. It's not a repeat of August. It's not a repeat of the second album. It's a whole new thing. It's Desert Life. It's coming together. And suddenly their record label Geffen is sold in some conglomerate, you know, corporate merger. And they become effectively signed to Interscope all of a sudden without ever agreeing to that so suddenly instead of being on geffen with nirvana and the cranberries and suede they're on interscope with limp biscuit and eminem and dr dre (laughs) and these are who they're they're not these are their label mates and also now their competition so the the people at interscope immediately said let's call a meeting and uh, we want to hear this new album and so they go to the house i think these guys are all like 20 years old driving their maseratis all right Let's hear this album. You know, they're spinning the new Eminem in the car. And then uh, Adam plays them. He played the Mrs. Potter's Lullaby. He said, it's eight minute song and we're not cutting any of it. And it's acoustic. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was not a good meeting. They they just, they weren't feeling it at all. So eventually he had to go to the head of Enderscope and, you know, sort of talk him down and say, listen, you got to leave us alone and just let us do our thing. And he said that they basically agreed to, but in some ways this was the beginning of the end for their, dealings with major labels because you know eventually after i think it was their fifth album they were dropped by geffen and went independent and they've been independent since then and i think uh, largely this had to do with their clashes over the record you know what to do with their music how to distribute their music online adam wanted to give away a lot of their music on on their uh, i think it was their fifth album he wanted to give away 
the whole album. <laughs> and Geffen really? said, uh, no, we sell albums. That's all we sell. We can, you know. And so there was they were fighting over it. Eventually he he got them to agree to give away two songs instead of the whole thing. But he, he fought with his record label a lot. And you know, they also had a good partnership. They made money together, but ultimately Counting Crows went independent. And you know, that's that's been good in some ways because now they can do whatever they want. At the same time, it was I think it was kind of good to have somebody from the label calling every once in a while and going, hey, guys, you got that new album finished yet? Or, you know, like, oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Because otherwise because, it could take forever. You can have Chinese democracy. <laughs> well, they haven't, they haven't put China. out a studio album since 2014, you right. know, Counting Crows, nine years and they put out one EP. So maybe it'd be nice. Yeah. To have. Even Axl Rose probably could have done a little better than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, Hard Candy, 2002. So that's the last with Geffen? No, it was, it was Saturday one nights more? and Sunday mornings. Yeah, it was the last 2008. one. 2008. Okay. Yeah. Which the is a really good album. record with Geffen. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, Saturday nights, they, Sunday they, mornings. There's a lot of mellow, very folkish, very uh, acoustic. Some nice stuff in there. There's one, uh, 1492 is a good tune, but there's one about, I, I believe I, I, it's about him just kind of walking around uh, New York. What's it called? Uh, oh, Washington, Washington Square. Square. Yeah, yeah, great song. Yeah. Well, Saturday nights and Sunday mornings, you know, in some ways that was probably the most difficult album for them to make. Adam was at a very low point in his sort of mental health and was struggling, taking a lot of, he was never a guy who did, you know, street drugs, at least since he became a rock star, he was getting prescription drugs and trying to get his medications right, but really having a lot of problems during the recording of that album. He said he was almost like passed out during a lot of parts of it. And they would have to like, you know, pull him off the off the you know floor to go, go sing. That album is is sort of a two-part album, the Saturday nights part are of like hard rock songs. And then he conceived it as a double album. The second half are the Washington Squares, When I Dream of Michelangelo's, the slower, acoustic-y, you know, more folksy side of the Counting Crows. So it's one of those albums that's got both sides of the band. If you want to hear the, the hard rock side of the band, you go to the Saturday nights. If you want the more mellow stuff, you got the Sunday mornings, and it's kind of all there. But again, he fought with the label over this. They didn't want to do this. They said, don't give us a double album. Give us a single album. Don't give us all hard rock songs up front and then the mellow stuff at the end mix it up you know they they wanted them to do something much more traditional but again he said no this is my concept this is my art take it or leave it and and uh you know he ultimately he did have artistic control over what he did much i think to the chagrin of geffen going back a little bit again to yeah, hard yeah, candy because i don't want to breeze over that one because that's i don't either i love that because, album. yeah it's a great album and also i i think from what i recall Adam was a little bummed because he was intentionally writing songs that had hooks and, and were really good radio single worthy tracks. American Girls, Miami, Big Yellow Taxi, If mm -hmm. I Could Give All My Love, Richard Manuel mm -hmm. Is Dead. Those are all the singles. It did well, mm -hmm. but was he mm -hmm. a little bummed that it didn't do better? Or Because uh, now we're getting into that period where new decade, taste change. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Well, music was changing a lot, but sure. I, I think that, uh, you know, to some degree, Adam was stung by the criticism of recovering the satellites. I, I think he was hurt by the fact that that didn't sell as well. Desert Life sold half as many as that and Hard Candy half as many as that. So they're, you know, in some ways their sales kept, you know, having over the years. And I think probably he did feel like, wow, I'm doing some of my best work and fewer people are buying it. At the same time, it's partially just reflective of the changes in the music industry. Sure. Nobody was buying CDs in 2004. Everybody was just downloading them on LimeWire. Now everybody streams them. And so now we know that a top 10 album only sells 20,000 copies because nobody buys records anymore. We all stream them. So I do think that he was hurt by that. But at the same time, you know, he said in interviews during that time, you know, I don't worry too much about the sales. The bean counters worry about that. I worry about making great music. And also he pointed out people still come to our concerts. He said, you know, a lot of these bands are out there struggling. We pack them every night. Because of that, they were able to sustain themselves by touring. And as we talked about earlier, sort of increasing the amount of time they spent on the road. And they became this band in some ways that was always on the road and couldn't get off the road in some, in some cases. They started recording their albums while they were touring rather than taking time off to go record. I mean, they became in some ways economically dependent upon uh, having to tour all the time. And so, to some degree, that was because they were selling fewer albums. But 
everyone was selling fewer albums. So. Yeah, I mean, that's it now. Today, that is the music business. It's it's right. touring is where you make the money and, uh, and merchandise. They, they and yeah. Mm -hmm. Big Yellow Taxi, I want to ask you about that. That's the cover of Joni Mitchell, the Joni Mitchell classic. That was among a batch of cover songs that, at least according to Billboard, were recorded for a covers album. They recorded a cover of Pure Prairie League's Amy. Now, did that covers album, Eventually. did those songs surface Under, underwater on Underwater Sunshine? Sunshine? Are, are those the songs? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I was I From 20, 2012, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Underwater Sunshine is 2012. The covers album. So I had the exact same question because – you know, that one of the things they did way back in the day was they always used to go to New Orleans. They love New Orleans, spent a lot of time there. And they would go to New Orleans and do these like cover shows where they're just playing acoustically, you bringing their friends up on stage. It was usually just Adam and like whoever else from the band was there. Immer Gluck played a lot of them. But often it was just covers. They would play unreleased Crows songs. Sometimes they would play old Crows songs, but the covers was really the point. And they would play 30 different cover songs. And every year it became this annual tradition, the Shim Sham Show, the great bootlegs of those available. And doing covers became kind of a little thing that that uh, especially Adam was very interested in. So one of the things they started doing at that time was recording the covers. Let's record these cover songs and we're going to ultimately do a covers album out of it. So they were they were recording these songs in in with the idea of doing a covers album. And ultimately, I thought the same thing. Oh, okay. So these are all the cover songs that eventually came out in 2012. Turns out that's not true. They re-recorded all of those songs later. But the story of Big Yellow Taxi, I think, is also interesting because there's a little more to the story than I knew and, and many people know. They originally recorded that song and put it on Hard Candy. And they were trying to do something a little different. They said, let's do a song that has kind of a hip hop beat. So they got this kind of hip hoppy producer guy, didn't do the album, but just to do that song and like produce this song. I think they thought they were going to use this for a covers album, but they liked their cover of it so much. They said, let's put this on the Hard Candy album. So they put their uh, version of Big Yellow Taxi at the end of Hard Candy as a hidden track. And it was kind of a forgotten thing. The fans listened to it and liked it. Now, a year later, a year goes by, Hard Candy's out. A year goes by, that same producer, I, I, it's in the book, I can't remember his name, but he was the producer. He was like a hip hop -y kind of contemporary pop producer. He produced Vanessa Carlton uh, and did her big song, A Thousand Miles. That was his producer. So he said, oh, I just had this big hit with Vanessa Carlton. I'm going to have her sing over the top of this Counting Crows song that I did. They weren't in the studio together. They, I don't even think the Counting Crows had, knew about it. And I'm going to have her sing over their song. And then they ended up putting that version of it with her basically doing karaoke over her their song uh, in a movie. And that became a huge hit. That's the, the version of Big Yellow Taxi that everybody knows. They made Geffen immediately said, well, let's do a music video. And they also said, we're pulling your version of Big Yellow Taxi off of Hard Candy and replacing it with this new version with Vanessa Carlton singing on it. And it's not going to be a hidden track anymore. We're going to list it on the album. They put that on their greatest hits album after the fact. So wow. it was interesting to see how Geffen and, and the, the powers that be in the music industry sort of remade this song, you know, uh, without the Crows involvement really, and, and turned it into a hit and then redid their album and took their own song off of their album and replaced it with this other one. I'm not saying that they were upset about this. It was a big hit for them. They even played the song together. Counting Crows and Vanessa Carlton did, did the song live once. So I don't think that anyone was upset about it. As I understand it, they met for the first time and said, hey, we sang on a hit song together. It, it was all fine. But it's just interesting how I didn't know any of that about that song. I, what I remember is I do remember their version of it being on Hard Candy originally because I bought that album when it came out. And then I remember, you know, a year later when the, the new version came out and I'm like, yeah, that I, I never liked that. <laughs> As you could tell, that second version very much. Album reached number five. Big Yellow Taxi, number 42 on the Billboard 100. Only 42. I'm surprised. I yeah. thought it did better than that. They do get the top 40 single, Accidentally in Love, from yeah. Shrek 2, 2004. And again, something that you mentioned hanging around earlier, and I think Accidentally in Love goes into this same category of Adam saying to himself, okay, I have to be sort of strategic, and I have to write a particular type of song. And he just nails it. You know, he's, he's yeah. such a brilliant songwriter that he could be strategic and say, I have to write a song. And he was given, you know, as you can imagine, this is a Pixar film. 
DreamWorks and it was DreamWorks. Yeah. So you can imagine the money involved here. This is Shrek 2. Shrek 1 was, you know, one of the biggest, you know, children's films of all time. So there's a lot riding on this song. And of, of course, this was again, DreamWorks was co-owned by David Geffen, who owned Geffen Records, who the Counting Crows was signed to. So um, eventually Counting Crows get the, or Adam Duritz gets the opportunity to go in and take a look at the film and see if he can come up with something. They had tried a lot of different songwriters and nobody could come up with a good song. They had to open the film. It was going to be the first single released before the soundtrack and it was going to be the first song on the soundtrack. So this is the first song you see when you watch the movie. It's the first song you hear when you play the soundtrack and it's going to lead off the entire media campaign for the film. So there is a lot writing on this song. And Adam, you know, once again, went in and just executed and brilliantly wrote a song that's just perfect for you know, for what they needed. And um, I, I think he wrote a great, another great song. The next three studio albums, 2008 Saturday nights and Sunday mornings that reached number three on billboard, the singles 1492. You can't count on me come around. Mm -hmm. And when I dream of Michelangelo 2012's mm -hmm. covers album, underwater sunshine, or what we did on our summer vacation, number 11 on billboard that includes the single untitled love song, and uh, my personal favorite in that one is uh, their cover of Fairport Conventions, Meet on the Ledge. That's a great one, too. Oh, um, yeah, that yeah, is good. Yeah. A point that we were talking about a little bit earlier, just to clarify that I, too, thought that these I just figured, OK, they took everything they had ever recorded as a cover song and slapped it together and made this compilation. But that's not what they did. They actually did go record all those songs as a as a new collection of songs. So even things like Amy, which I think they had recorded earlier, they re-recorded for that album. And so those are like fresh versions of those songs. And I, I too, love Meet on the Ledge and Untitled Love Song. And what's so great about that album is songs like that. I had never heard Untitled well, Love Song. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Crows You're there. so, yeah. yeah, these aren't songs that were bonafide hits these are songs that are deep tracks that mm -hmm. few may know about yeah and so in in that sense they almost became like new counting crow songs because you didn't have you know any memories or baggage attached to the songs you know we yeah. all know amy of course but there there weren't a lot of songs like that on on that covers album no ooh la la by face is somewhat familiar yeah people but, and, other, but other than that yeah it's not it's a lot of obscurities and again this just goes to that point i was making earlier about the artistic choices that Adam Duras has made throughout his career. He wasn't always in search of a hit. You know, most acts, when they put out a cover album, they're just looking to sell some records. They're going to put some, you know, some crowd pleasing favorites on there. County Crows decided that they were going to make another record uh, and not just a covers album. And, uh, you know, that's, that's why you still want to listen to those songs today. 2014 somewhere under wonderland peaked at number six scarecrow. Mm -hmm. Great song. Mm -hmm. God of Ocean Tides, another great song, and Earthquake Driver, the singles. And there was also a cool EP titled Butter Miracle Sweet One, which has a great single, Elevator Boots. Now, rewinding back to 2005, 2006, yeah. you lead off Chapter 6, uh, saying that Adam reached a dark time around then. You were alluding to this before. Can you talk about mm -hmm. where Adam and the band were at that time? How long was it before Adam was able to pull himself out of all that? Uh, how did he recover? And you mentioned the band playing the grand opening of a shopping mall in Kansas City, which is so hard to imagine. And this is <laughs> Big Yellow Taxi kind of right. is part of this story, too. Oh, right. Yes, because they they played in a parking lot and they're singing <laughs> and, and they were contractually required to play Big Yellow Taxi at this opening of this parking lot and shopping mall. Yeah, I was using <laughs> that to sort of illustrate how far they had fallen because this was a band that was so lauded and and critically acclaimed and and also prided themselves on you know always doing making the artistic choices refusing to play mr jones when they went on saturday night live they refused to play that first they refused to play top of the pops where the beatles and the stones and the who had played because they refused to lip sync so this band who had you know made all these credible decisions early in its career was now playing you know shopping malls and and also i think aligning with bands that just weren't in the same category as them touring with bands that just honestly weren't on their level musically and i think that that diminished the group too adam has said that the one thing they always managed to do through all of it was play and perform and it's true he did even in that kansas city show it sounds like he was having a hard time getting out of bed at the time but he'd only get up to go to the show and he would make it to the show. So that is to his credit. But there was a very dark time. It really started with the passing of his grandmother. And I, I talk about this in the book. 
this was something I didn't know about, but he had a close relationship with her, especially as a child. But as he grew and especially as he became a rock star, he became very distant, partially just because he's busy, he became very distant from his family, from his grandmother. And I think that her death profoundly affected him because he realized how much of real life he was missing because he was living this life of the rock star. And when we say rock star, maybe our VH1 image is, is of, you know, partying on the road and having a great time. But I think Adam is somebody who's always been pretty isolated and that includes on the road. I think he keeps to himself a lot. He has to protect his voice. He can't talk a lot uh, when he's out on the road. He, they tour all the time. He's really got to protect that voice. And so he spends a lot of his days not speaking to people, not because he doesn't want to, but because he's trying to preserve his voice. So I, I think during that time, he was especially isolated. He was having serious mental health issues that he talked about. He has a dissociative disorder, a psychological disorder that, you know, he says makes him feel unrealistic, like life is not real. And he was also trying to manage this with a bunch of doctors and pharmaceuticals who were, you know, not giving him, you know, what, things that were helping him. So he was really struggling with the pharmaceutical side of things. He was gaining a lot of weight. He talked about that during this time. He said he kind of turned into Brian Wilson around this time. He weighed 250 pounds and, you know, wow. he was an athlete when he was in uh, high school. He was a, a star soccer player and played tennis and stuff like that. So he was very athletic as a, as a young person. And um, he just sort of, yeah, as he described it, kind of let it all go. Eventually, it, and and he chronicled this on the Saturday Night's album. I mean, that's the album when he was probably at his lowest point. And he put a lot of that energy into that album to his credit. But he also started to eventually sort of come around a little bit. And he said that's when he envisioned that Sunday Morning's album that, you know, not necessarily a redemption of the night before, but, you know, maybe the hangover after the the crazy night before and wrote the Sunday's album. And in some ways, I think that helped lift him out of it. Ultimately, he came to the realization that the best thing he could do is develop a routine where he keeps his medicines organized and together, but where he's out on the road. He really likes to be on the road. He doesn't like to sit at home. So this is why they tour, because he said there's a routine. I have something to do. I have people to talk to because I have to interact with everybody because we're on the road and I have to talk to the sound engineers and, and I, everybody when I'm on the road. So I have to interact with people. I can't just lie in my apartment by myself. So he says the the routine of the road has really been what, what kind of saved him. And he wrote about that in songs like Come Around, where he writes about the sort of redemptive power of just going out on the road with the band. He's kind of wrote about that in Daylight Fading too, this idea that, you know, maybe the best solution is just to hit the road with the band. By the way, I forgot to mention Palisades Park too from that 2014 album. That's another great single. That Epic. was a single yeah. Yeah, from Somewhere Under Wonderland. Well, so he's now 59. Yeah. He's touring, as you say. Mm -hmm. Will there be another album? Have you heard anything? Would you like mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. to hear another well, album? I, what do you hope for I, the future of the band? Oh, that's a great question. Well, you know, Somewhere Under Wonderland, also had some, like Possibility Days. That's I think that closes the album, which I think is one of his very best songs he's ever written. I, I think that, you know, to me, you hear like Possibility Days or God of Ocean Tides, and it's like he is still writing songs that are as good as he ever wrote them. Got great opinion. reviews, yeah. All music, four out of yeah. five stars. Uh, Daily Telegraph, yeah. four out of five stars, yeah. yeah. The critics finally came back around and realized, yep. okay, there's nobody left but this band, so we might might as well start praising them and, and appreciating them. So yeah, I thought that was a great album. As Adam has described it, he was very surprised. You know, he's like, I'm making some of my best music, but people aren't really buying it. And I think in some ways, he's just decided that they haven't really put out a full album since 2014. And I, they put out the EP and I, I they were going to do a second part of that, but I even heard that's been scrapped. I think to some degree, he's like, why should I bother to record albums if people aren't interested in hearing the albums, you know? So- yeah. I think these days he focuses a lot on the live show and he kind of centers his artistic energy around the live show. So I, I don't, you know, I don't think that they have anything like right on deck about to come out and they're not a prolific band. They've, they've only released six studio albums and the, and the one covers album in a 30 year career. Think of it like REM released five albums before they signed to Warner Brothers. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, back in the 70s, bands released two albums in one year. Yeah. 
I mean, the, the Doors, I don't know how long, over four years doors, they put yeah, out that many yeah. albums, you know. So they've always been a band that's taken their time. And and I think that, you know, what would I hope for the future? I guess what I would hope for the future is is that the band would decide that they want to experiment more. They want to change it up. They want to play songs that they never played before. They want to dig out every single old, they only have six albums. They should play every song from every album. They should play all the covers. I'd like to hear them do alts that they've never done before. I'd like them, you know, to deconstruct songs that they haven't deconstructed or reimagine songs in new ways. I would just like them to get more creative and more energized around the improvisation and stuff like that. Will they do that? I don't think so. I don't, I don't, I think that Adam has sort of found what he's willing to do, but also his voice can only do so much too. He doesn't have the vocal range to sing some of those songs, the w- at least the way that he used to sing them. He can't. He just literally, physically cannot hit those high notes anymore, or he would blow his voice out if he tried. So he has to preserve his voice and be careful. So to some degree, you know, some of the songs would be hard for him, I think, to go out and do. It's not that he doesn't want to do them. And in some ways, it's another tragedy. I mean, I didn't write about this in the book, partially because I, I, I hadn't you know, sort of seen him in concert lately at, and noticed it as much, but this is someone whose greatest gift was his voice. And to some degree, he's lost a bit of that. I mean, think of like a, a great runner, you know, who breaks an ankle or something. It's it, there's a tragic element to it in some ways. And I, I sense that he knows that too. I mean, he knows he can't hit those notes and he probably wishes he could. And in some ways there's a tragedy to that too. There's a, a melancholy and, mournful quality to the Counting Crows music today, because I think in some ways, Adam is, is limited to what he can do in terms of his own catalog. And that that's got to feel, I I would imagine that would feel kind of frustrating to someone who who has such a gift, you know, Rain King, the life and music of Adam Duritz and Counting Crows by Jeff Harkness. You can find it anywhere books are sold, Amazon, all those usual places, right? And where can people find you online? Just the, the usual places. I, I This is my fourth book, so I, you can read other things that I've written. You can find those in all the places uh, that people usually buy books. And and uh, you can you can find things that I've done on, on YouTube, uh, documentaries and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm out there. I was a music journalist for years. And many of the things that I published as a music journalist, you know, fortunately survived and are still online. So there's, there's lots of stuff out there. I don't have a website. I don't, I don't really do the social media and stuff like that, but I'm working, I'm working on a, a new book right now. And the, I just finished the audio book of the ranking. I, I imagine that'll either be out by the time people hear this or uh, very soon afterwards. So I'm, I'm excited about that because people have been asking me to do it. And yeah, I, I wanted to ask you though, Eric, because yeah. you said earlier that Sullivan Street was your favorite song yes. from August. And I wanted to circle back and just ask you, you know, what was it about that song that um, that makes you say that's the one? You know, it's a, it too, it, but... and I'm glad you asked that because it's actually kind of strange as to why I connect with the song and see if I can explain it. But when I graduated yeah. from college, I was really bummed because I was like, this is that's the end of a period in my life. You know, I'm kind of bummed. Right. What do I do now? I was at home and I and I turned all the lights down and I just I remember just lying on the floor just staring at the ceiling. I put on August and everything and after, and Sullivan Street comes on when he sings the lyric "Take the way home" leads back to Sullivan Street. Sullivan Street just in my mind was that life. Like I wish I could just go back home to that life again. You know, if I could just take that road down to to Sullivan Street or the or my, my old life one more time. I don't know why it hit me that way. It just struck me that way. And the song is not about anything like that. I mean, I don't know what the song is specifically about. Do you know? A little bit. And he describes it as being about, he was in a relationship with this woman and he, I think he would drive her home at night along Sullivan street. And then he would drive home by himself. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was this sort of driving along the street that just, brought out these feelings in him or whatever. But I think what's interesting about a band like Counting Crows is that everybody hears their songs differently. They mean something different to different people. I was just talking to somebody about Anna Begins, which is one of my very, right. very favorite songs by them. I, I think that's just such a good song, even even today. And a friend of mine, I was saying, well, you know, Anna Begins is about sort of young love and, you know, that feeling of young love that's just so overwhelming. And 
uh, although, you know, I can relate to it. It's kind of hard to relate to it. And he was saying, oh, you know, I just had my first child. And and to me, I hear Anna begins, you know, it's about childhood. It was about, it was about fatherhood, right. you know? And so she's talking in her sleep, you know, like every time she sneezes, I, I believe it's love, you know? And he's like, that's what it's like to be a father. And I'm like, that is what it's like to be a father, you know? Yeah. So I think that these songs can mean different things, even to the same person at different times in their life. And you know, it's one of the things that makes this band so special. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's just a particular lyric or a verse that you, mm -hmm. that really hits you, and that's mm -hmm. what it was with that particular song. I don't know why it just hit me at that moment in time, and I always right. think about that now. I just feel like it just represented what was, and if I could only go back down that street one more time, it's just the way it's it hit me. Street. Weird, right? <laughs> no, I think that's awesome. I mean, that's. That's the power of music is that it it elicits memories and feelings and, you know, like what a powerful feeling you had in that moment that you're still remember it today. Yeah. You're still talking about it yeah. today. And it's because of that song. If you put that song on, you're going to go right back to that. Yes. Moment, right. Lying back on to the floor. Room, yeah. On the floor. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Lying right. on the floor. I mean, my, my old my old bedroom I grew up in. Jeff Harkness. Thanks for coming on. This was super fun. Loved it.